you all very much. It's always wonderful to start with a really convicting song before we get to a convicting sermon, right? So we just started out that way. Now, Cademan's Call, if you guys are familiar with them, uh, I think I found them first when I was in college. And it's just one of those bands that's just really honest about things of the faith and things where they, they struggle. And, and one of those things for many of us is our faith, that not so much that we doubt the Lord, but sometimes we do in some situations or we wonder what we believe and it can be like this shifting sand that we struggle with. And this past Thursday, though, was one of those wonderful times of just seeing the Lord work. Judith and I sat in a courtroom full of people who were in tears, uh, and myself included, just witnessing this divine intervention. And a few, a few of y'all know what I'm talking about, but it was just this incredible answer to prayer. Uh, if you guys are not aware, I did ask permission to share this, but the Creed family has finally been able to adopt uh, people that used to be known as Z Abby and Zoe, and they are now Macy and Ava. And so we got to celebrate together. And it, was just, uh, it was just one of the, those most beautiful things. The judge uh, who is in that picture there made it very clear to the Creed family, there is no going back on this. This isn't one of those things where you take them in and say, eh, I don't like them anymore. They're being annoying. They go back. Now, th th this... They're, they're children, and there's just so much excitement and joy. And so it, it was sweet for us because, you know, Judith and I, we are awaiting having that same joy. And, and because we as, as a family, along with many other friends and all of us, I think, as, as a church, have, have been praying for these people, for this family for so long. And, and, and honestly, it just, it was getting to points where I don't know that a lot of people knew this, but it looked like this was not going to happen. Everything was going against them being able to adopt, but then God just turned so many minds around seemingly overnight. I mean, it went from, no way, this is terrible, How, what are we going to do, to we're going to adopt them. <laughs> it's just amazing. And so it was a really faith-strengthening time. But the sweetness of the event, it was it was more than just love for the creeds and, and particularly for, for these little girls. It, and it's more than even just the, the thankfulness for this absolutely amazing act of God to move in, in the state and in the court system and, and through so many others. This is a picture of what God has done for us. And we talked about that just coming out of the, the courtroom. Several of us were kind of standing there talking about that right after the hearing. And God has made us his adopted children in Christ. We are irrevocably joined to his family. We are, we are grafted into Jesus Christ. We'll look at how Paul describes that in Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2 today. But we'll start here. I just want to look at this to start out. Verses 3 through 8. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. And so in verse 3, you can imagine the Father in heaven just pouring these blessings down on the head of Jesus, the Son, our Savior. And it's like this fountain that those blessings just pour from him down to his body that is us, and we get to experience those. And in verse 4, even more than the Creed family wanted those girls, God wanted you. And he chose you. He was not reluctant in doing this. He's not going back on it in verse 5. He adopted you. He adopted me, those who are in Christ Jesus. And so that in Jesus, we are children of the King. And we call the King and the creator of the universe, Daddy. In verse 6, he, he, he pours out his grace on us in love. He's cleansing us from sin at absolutely no cost to us and yet incredible cost to Jesus so that in verse 7 we see that we are redeemed. We are purchased with his infinite wealth. We are forgiven based on what we see in verse 8 on his insight and that is just barely scratching the surface of the blessings that we find in Jesus Christ alone. And that is the gospel. 
this rich truth. It is more than just how we're saved. It's not this thing that has happened to us as Christians in the past. It is how we continue to live. It's how we find true life, abundant life. And there are billions of people in the world right now missing out on this truth. And there's some in this room who are missing out on this truth, and there are many of us, I'm sure, in this room who are simply not living within this truth, practically living in it. And far too often, I mean, just repeatedly, we act like this is something that God did for us in the past, and we think that now life is up to us. If we want to find joy and peace and holiness, that that we continue that by our own efforts and our own works, and sometimes even faith is one of those works, we think. It's kind of like that that past stuff is forgiven, but if you sin again, at least if it's one of those sins that's big enough, then you've got to go and beg God's forgiveness again. And and then if you're sorry enough or if you make the right change or or do something right, then God's going to take your sin count on his clipboard that he's keeping about your life and finally take it back down to zero. And yes, when we sin, we we do want to confess and ask forgiveness, but it doesn't impact our salvation. We look at verse 13 of the same chapter. Our salvation is in Jesus. It says, in him, you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. And so we hear the gospel and we believe it and we trust that. We trust in Jesus and the Holy Spirit brands us and seals us as God's child. And Jesus, our salvation is secure. But when we're not living out those things that we believe, when we struggle to actually walk in that, we end up getting robbed of our joy and sometimes even robbed of the fruit that God has created us for. And we have this heavy burden on ourselves because we try to make it all about us. That's actually the kind of thing, not just that people lived, but that the church actually was teaching in the Middle Ages. Some still do now. That Jesus forgives our past, but the rest of that is up to you to maintain that salvation. That's what the reformers, as we're celebrating 500 years since that time, it's what the reformers were reacting to. And they were used by God to get us back as his church, back to truth and back to freedom and back to grace and just simply back to himself. And it's the same message that we need for ourselves now to be reminded of from time to time to just reform our own hearts and minds and our, our daily lives and the way that we live, to, to renew that joy that we are supposed to have in Christ that is offered to us. And so as a church, we're walking through the five solas of the Reformation, sola alone, and it all starts that it is in Christ alone. We look to him, and last week we were reminded that we see Christ, we receive Christ by grace alone. It's not, it's not ours. This week we want to look at how that happens. That we receive that grace of Jesus Christ, how we get to be in Jesus, and that comes by faith alone. My prayer is that today we will understand the place of faith and works together and, and find freedom in Jesus. So let's pray to that end. Father, as we come to your word and we want, we want to receive your truth, we want to live in this. And I pray, Lord, that especially for those of us in those times where our faith feels like it is the, the shifting sand of our lives, that we've somehow turned faith into this thing that we muster up, that we contribute rather than what it is that you've given to us, Lord, that we can rest in your grace, that you would restore our faith, that you would strengthen it. And Lord, that in the midst of this, in your grace and in Christ through faith, Lord, that we would receive joy, fresh and new and abundant. Turn away from those other things that we keep running to, to to find life. And just find it where the source of life really is in Christ alone. And trust you for it, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. To understand biblical faith, we've got to start with who we are. We've got to start as well with, with who we were without faith in Jesus. And at that point, we are dead. Ephesians chapter 2 is where we're hanging out, starting out in verse 1, if you want to turn there. And Paul writes here, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. 
And so for all those movies and TV shows and comics about you know, zombies and people prepping for the zombie apocalypse to come, do you realize there are actually billions of zombies in this world? Now, I will say there was this minor debate Thursday afternoon about whether this illustration should have to do with zombies or vampires, because these are deep theological questions that we need to ask, right? But I'm the pastor, and I went with uh, zombies, and I was going to have a picture, but Sarah said that was too gross, so we didn't do it, right? Apart from Jesus Christ, though, all people are spiritually walking dead, right? I mean, that's, that's how we're living. It is the natural condition of humanity. And so Paul, as he is inspired writing scripture by the Holy Spirit, he didn't write that we were sick. He didn't say that we are feeble or needy or weak. He wrote dead. He did not say we were mostly dead, right? Because we know you can come back from that. No, this is the kind of dead where there, there is no cure, right? There is not a motivational speech. There is no potion that is bringing us back from this. We are dead. We don't need help. We need resurrection. We don't need restoration. We need resurrection. Elsewhere, Paul refers to us who are the walking dead. He says that we are slaves to sin. You can get rid of that picture now. <laughs> It's not just that we are, we are dead. That's bad enough, right? We're also dead and we're enslaved spiritually. But as these zombie slaves, we didn't usually feel like slaves. It just felt like we were fulfilling the cravings of our flesh. The flesh wanted food, so we fed it with whatever kind of sin it was craving at the time. Whatever was available. That's the human nature. That's who we are apart from Christ. And verse 3 says that we desired that, that we were, we were just doing what we wanted. And so those desires and those lusts, they are our slave masters. And so in a way, it felt free. It feels like I'm totally free. I'm just doing whatever I want, which is the trick of the whole thing, that those desires and lusts are enslaving us. We do that because we are slaves to sin. We are mindlessly just following Satan. And if we're following Satan, we are eventually going to follow him all the way to where he's going to end up. In hell, facing the wrath of God. That is his final destination. And apart from Christ, that is ours. We are dead apart from Christ. We are dominated. We are doomed. We are damned. And even in Jesus, when we were freed from that old master and brought back to life, we still struggle with wanting to follow that old master right? Sometimes it's, it's something that we, we don't even know that we're doing. Sometimes it's just one-time slip-up, like, oh, I knew I shouldn't have done that. Sometimes we let the flesh, I mean, we intentionally just let the flesh continue to enslave us. We deny that it's wrong in the first place. We have these little pet sins that we refuse to admit or we refuse to deal with or we want to make excuses for. And those are like little zombies that we've decided to keep around like pets, even though they want to eat us and kill us. So sin, that, that spiritual death, it has to be killed. It has to be put away in our lives going forward as Christians the same way it was in the first place. How did that happen? By Christ alone. And so my question is, as you think about those, those things that you struggle with, what are those little zombie pets that you need to put to death. This will probably be the first and only time that in your notes, in your bulletin, you actually see the word zombie. Just roll with it, right? Because that really is what those things are. They're these gross, nasty, dead things that are trying to make us dead like them. Even though we're secure in Jesus, sin just, it eats at us and it keeps us from experiencing the real life that Jesus calls us to. That's who we are, who we were without Jesus. Seemingly completely hopeless because we're dead. There is no hope for dead. Except we are dead and yet called to life. Continue on in verses 4 and 5. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. It's true. Salvation, true salvation, isn't help. It isn't assistance. It isn't even rescue. It is resurrection. We are brought from death to life. That's what we symbolize in baptism, right? 
which sounds really crazy to say you're coming from death back to life if you don't know Jesus. But Jesus, walking on this earth, physically walking on this earth, he proved that he had power over death, not just spiritual death, but even over physical death, all forms of death. Anyone know the story about Jesus and his friend Lazarus? Yeah, I mean, a few of us have heard that one probably, right? He goes to this guy, Lazarus. Lazarus, he got sick and he died. He's been dead about four days when Jesus gets to the tomb. And Jesus just tells Lazarus to come out of the tomb. Now, a lot of us, if you grew up in church, you heard this story time and time and time again. And kind of like in the song there that, you know, you can kind of explain it away or it becomes a small thing. But guy arrives, Jesus, and he tells a dead man to come on out of the tomb. Hey, dead guy, come here. That sounds crazy. This is not normal. How many of you have ever seen this happen? Right. If you did, what would you do? You're calling for help, right? No. So the crazy thing about this is that he actually did it. The dead guy just is like, okay, and he gets up and he comes out. This, this is abnormal kind of stuff. And that's what Paul is saying happened to us when we heard the gospel. But if you haven't responded to that yet, you are hearing the gospel today. And it's Jesus' call to come forth out of death and back to life with a question of, are you going to respond? Will you do it? But how does a dead person hear Jesus' call and then respond? I don't know. I just know that Jesus made it happen, right? It's not like Lazarus was a really good listener, right? Right? He's not a great listener at that point. He can't take credit for this. It's not like other corpses would be coming back to life if they were just better listeners or if they were more willing to obey or to respond, right? All of the power is in Christ and his call, and somehow his call makes the dead hear and respond. And he continues to do that in people today. And so if you need to respond, you don't wait until we come to the end of this message. Don't wait for me to finish. I mean, there are people around you that want to guide you into this and tell you what this means and what it's all about. Grab one of them and just go have a conversation. Spend some time talking and praying together and in God's word. Like, just now, do it. But he keeps calling as well, not just to people who have never heard, but he calls to those who have already come back to life, he calls to us when we struggle to experience full life. And the power to come to life and the power to experience true life is the same power. It's all from Jesus. So are you experiencing abundant life, true life? Do you realize that is what Jesus desires for you? It's true and abundant life, real, true life. And he wants to provide that as we trust in him. And yet, way too often, we want to run to the things that evil wants to provide for us. To all those things that enslaved us to find life. There are churches out there right now, at this moment, there are pastors preaching that those are the things that Jesus wants to provide for you. And that's not the stuff where we find real life, because those things fail. I'd encourage all of you to go into last week's Cup of Grace, and I get to brag on my wife a little bit because she wrote that one. And yes, okay, I get that this is one of those things that is usually addressed to the women of the church. Anybody can read it. It's okay, right? But she's really open in here. She, she's just talking about those things that we substitute for Jesus in trying to find life. They're called idols. And, and they look like desires. They look like comfort. They look like pleasure. They look like fun. They even look like they're going to bring us life and joy. But they are deadly distractions that only Jesus frees us from. See, we, we never graduate from the gospel. We were dead, and yet we were called to life in Jesus. And that is to find life, and that is to continue in life. Verses 6 and 7, Paul writes in there, and raised us up with him, with Jesus, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. In our natural state, we are so tied to Adam. We are so even tied to his curse and to Satan. We are dominated by Satan so much so that we are going to face the same end. His end is the wrath of God. And apart from Jesus, we, we'd go right there with him into that same torment. 
but then that great but, but Jesus. And Jesus, we are so tied to Jesus that we go where he does because we are in Jesus. We are in Christ. We are in him. So, I mean, look, there, there's water in this water bottle, right? So if I take this bottle home, where is the water going? It's going home. Right? It goes where, where that goes. And we're not going to take this analogy any further because it really breaks down theologically and it gets a little gross too, right? But that's kind of what it's like. And Jesus, we are so tied to him that where he goes, we go. If we're in Jesus, we go where he goes. And where is that? It is home with the Father in heaven, in eternity, and joy, and that glory. And those blessings that we looked at earlier in chapter 1, they come to all of us who are in Jesus Christ, just basking in the riches, richness of his love and his grace and his mercy. That's there for us in his kindness. And yes, that, that is an eternal promise, right? We don't have that in its fullness right here, right now in every way. And yet, we do. It's something still to come, and yet it's also something that we can taste now in Christ, Jesus said that if we abide in him, if we reside in him, if we are at home in him, if we find life in him, then we will find abundant life. And yet we want to settle for those old desires that we were so comfortable with before we were brought to life. I found even myself, I was confessing to Judith yesterday, okay, so... This is ridiculous, right? I'm just, just kind of going here anyway, completely ridiculous. But I found myself, because my football team was getting absolutely slaughtered yesterday, that I was more easily frustrated with my wife and my son. And we were going out to dinner with some other people in the middle of that game, and I was glad to be distracted from it because it was horrible. But if anybody wanted to mention that game to me, I wanted to slap them. I didn't. That's the power of the Holy Spirit in me, right? But what does that tell me? I was allowing a stupid football game. I probably wouldn't call it stupid if we had won, right? But I was allowing that thing to, to, to overcome true abundant joy. I was robbed of joy because of what a bunch of guys, teenagers in the early 20s, were doing on a football field in Alabama. That's ridiculous. Do you realize what God offers to me? And I want to find my joy and my identity in the Bulldogs. Thankfully, they lost, so I could figure that out. If they had won, I would still be living that way, and that would be horrible. And maybe I'm just making excuses to say, no, that's a good thing they lost, right? Yeah. So back to a normal message, right? So get, uh, get out of my crazy head here. This is one of the beauties, I think, of fasting, which may mean I just now fast from the Bulldogs until they start winning again, right? It's a great benefit of it that, that we set aside something that is distracting us from true life. We set aside something that is offering a lesser comfort and pleasure and joy so that we can find the real thing. I was finding joy in an undefeated season, which, quite frankly, I've never seen as a Bulldog fan. I was finding joy in that. I found pleasure in that. It was comfortable. And it made me want to read all these articles saying all these good things. But that doesn't last. Christ's joy does, and it's real. It really only makes sense this fasting only makes sense to set something like that aside if you're trusting in Jesus alone for life. I cannot set aside something that I enjoy, something that I love, something that I find life in, or maybe may distracting me from Christ. I cannot set that aside unless I believe truly that Jesus is better. And I'm going to walk and actively trust that. It's an ability that we have because we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit if we are in Jesus Christ. So where are you finding life? Is it in some kind of sin? Is it in your work? I mean, we're talking about work in our grace groups, and it's a wonderful thing. We're created to work. We're going to see in a moment created to do good works. But is that where we're supposed to find our life? Is it in your wealth? Is it in relaxation? Is it in your family? Oh, your family is good, right? All of these, except for sin, all of these things are good. Only sin is the bad one, but none of them is Jesus. I love my little boy and I love my wife. They are not Jesus. Oh, but they are wonderful gifts from him. 
Now we get to, though, how we receive Jesus. We were dead, yet we were called to life in Jesus through faith alone. In verses 8 and 9, I bet a bunch of us have this memorized. Let's even do this one together. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Try to imagine now Lazarus getting interviewed about his resurrection. And he starts giving the keys to being raised from the dead. He says, so when you die, what you've got to do is just try to stay alert. And you've got to listen for that voice to call you to life. You can't let the worms get in there and get your ears. You've got to make sure that you align yourself with the resurrection power through meditation after death. It's kind of ridiculous, right? There's nothing that he could do. What's he going to do if someone asks how it happened? I don't know. And he just points over to Jesus. He says, man, I got no idea what happened. I just know that I was dead. And then all of a sudden, I heard Jesus and I came out. And it's the same thing with our salvation. We've got nothing to offer. We can't clean up to be worthy of Jesus. And yet he brings us this salvation. You can't take yourself partway and then trust Jesus will get you the rest of the way there or say, okay, Jesus got me to this point. I'll get myself the rest of the way. That's not how it works. It's it's all him. And so the, the idea of a boasting or a bragging Christian is a paradox. None of us received salvation because we were more worthy or living in a better way than somebody else was. We are all dead, we are all dominated, we are all doomed, we are all damned, and we simply receive Jesus' salvation, eternal life and glory by faith. It is a free gift. And yet, in our fallen condition before Jesus, and in our struggles with the flesh after we've received him, we want to try to earn things rather than trusting. And so a question I often go to, if I want to understand where someone is with Christ spiritually, I'll say, who or what are you trusting in for your salvation? You may throw in there, who or what are you trusting in for life? And if it's anything but Jesus that you're trusting for salvation, you are still dead. And so it's the same too with our spiritual growth. If it's, not, if it's you and it's not the Holy Spirit, it's not real growth. If you're finding your life and your joy and your peace apart from Christ... It is counterfeit. It all comes from him through faith. And so when we try to add anything to that equation, we're calling Jesus a liar. We're saying that he is not powerful enough to do what he said he's going to do in our lives, to save us and to give us abundant life. What did Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. Not almost finished. Not I am finished. It is finished. The work is done. There's nothing that we can add. It is all by him. We simply trust him. And even the ability to to do that is from him. It's not from us. It's not our work and, and some kind of contribution there. And so when we start thinking of faith as a work itself, that our faith is the contribution, that our faith gets to be a little shaky, that it gets to stand on that shifting sand. So where is your boast? Are you more concerned with Jesus' work and his reputation, his glory, or your own? And for me, a lot of times, the answer to that question is often revealed when I start to get defensive. In those times that I'm being defensive, am I concerned about God's glory or my own and what people think about me? So, I'm not saying, and God's not saying that that works have no place or that they have no meaning. But apart from Jesus, they don't. We were dead, and yet we were called to life in Jesus through faith alone. And that faith is not lonesome. Verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. So this this is where it all comes together. We talked more extensively about this concept in in our James study last year. Works do matter. God desires our works. God created us to do good works. He has things for us to accomplish for that purpose. But our works are to be in his power. Our works do not earn salvation. The works I do for selfish reasons are not going to be edifying to me. Works are supposed to be a result of faith. 
Because I, Jesus has made you new, because he has brought you to life, you go and do work. You're not to work for your glory. You're not working to earn favor, but you're working because you trust that God's way is right. What he has said in his word is true and good and right, and you believe it. And so you want to do those things. You believe that's where you're going to find true joy. You believe that that's going to bring him glory, and that is the greatest thing for you too. We talked last week about being made new by grace, about being grafted into Jesus, about becoming a new tree, a good tree. And so good works are only possible in Jesus because he's made us to be a good tree, because then we can produce good fruit. And so because he has done that, because he has made you a good tree, has made you new, go and be fruitful in him, in his power. In the James study, we saw that good works are the result of true faith. And and it can be healthy in our lives, too. That's part of what I lead us to do week in and week out, to even look at the fruit of our lives. What is God doing in my life to see if he's changing me, if he's using me, if if I'm doing the works that he created me to do? And so I investigate fruit. Paul talked about church discipline in 1 Corinthians. We'll probably get to that next year. And he said that at some point you may have to, as a church, treat somebody who is living in sin continually, treat them as an unbeliever. And so what he's saying is that based on their lifestyle, the way that we see them continually acting, we as a church, we cannot attest that this person is regenerate. And so we can't call them a brother or a sister in Christ. And it's not that we want to punish them. It's not that we send them out and we treat them badly. We're protecting the body of Christ and yet wooing this person to Jesus just as we would any lost person. And we look at fruit to see about that, but we don't judge someone on those things. But believing faith, and believing faith is a gift in itself, it's not lonesome. It is a double gift. It comes with salvation and it comes with works. It comes with life change. I think sometimes, and I've heard this from people here, I've seen this in myself, that sometimes those of us who were saved at younger ages, we struggle with this concept because we don't necessarily see a lot of change right away, right? Because you haven't had, or maybe you've been raised in a Christian home and so you lived a moral life, and so you didn't necessarily notice on the outside a lot of change right away. But I think a good way to look at this in yourself and to find that fruit is, if it weren't for Jesus, how would you live differently? And it may be your outward actions. It can be ways of thought, too. But as you look at that and you see what he's doing differently in you, who you would have been without him and who you are now, praise him for the difference. Praise him for how he's changed you. And I know that the idea of faith and works, it can be tough to understand. And I've got no desire to cause unnecessary doubt with anybody. What we're really getting at is that in salvation and, and living the Christian life, We are supposed to only look to Jesus, that it's not about us. We're going to stumble, and it doesn't mean when we stumble, it doesn't mean that we are lost. It doesn't mean that we're lost. It's just that the Holy Spirit is still working on us. Anyone else in here, Holy Spirit, working on anyone? Yeah, constantly, right? And where I've struggled today to to get this kind of rich concept across, I think Charles Spurgeon does far better because, you know, he's Charles Spurgeon. He does everything better because he's brilliant and just a wonderful man of the Lord. Here's what he says. It is ever the Holy Spirit's work to turn our eyes away from self to Jesus. But Satan's work is just the opposite of this, for he is constantly trying to make us regard ourselves instead of Christ. He insinuates, your sins are too great for pardon. You have no faith. You do not repent enough. You will never be able to continue to the end. You have not the joy of his children. You have such a a wavering hold of Jesus. Anyone been there? Anyone have these kind of thoughts in your head at any point? Seriously, can we see a hand if you ever deal with this kind of stuff? Mine is actually up. It's not just an example, right? Here's what he says, all these are thoughts about self, and we shall never find comfort or assurance by looking within. But the Holy Spirit turns our eyes entirely away from self. He tells us that we are nothing, but that Christ is all in all. Remember, therefore, it is not thy hold of Christ that saves thee, it is Christ. It is not thy joy in Christ that saves thee, it is Christ. It is not even faith in Christ, though that be the instrument, it is Christ's blood and merits. Therefore, 
Look not so much to thy hand with which thou art grasping Christ as to Christ. Look not to thy hope, but to Jesus, the source of thy hope. Look not to thy faith, but to Jesus, the author and finisher of thy faith. We shall never find happiness by looking at our prayers, our doings, or or our feelings. It is what Jesus is, not what we are, that gives rest to the soul. If we would at once overcome Satan and have peace with God, it must be by looking unto Jesus. Keep thine eyes simply on him. Let his death, his sufferings, his merits, his glories, his intercession be fresh upon thy mind. When thou wakest in the morning, look to him. When thou liest down at night, look to him. Oh, let not thy hopes or fears come between thee and Jesus. Follow hard after him, and he will never fail thee. When your faith is like shifting sand, look to Jesus. In all of those struggles, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus constantly, and he will take care of the rest. Keep Jesus, keep his word, his gospel, keep it right there in front of you. That's why we come to Sunday school and grace groups. And that's why we have these sermons and that's why we have devotions and things. The joy and the growth as we focus on him and we keep his word and his truth in front of us, the joy will come. But first we look to Jesus. So I want you to just go ahead and turn to the person next to you. I realize for most of you there are two, so you have to turn both ways and do a little bit of coordinating here, okay? Figure out who you're turning to first and simply tell them, look at Jesus. You can say it louder. It's okay. Everybody's saying it. Then go to the other. My challenge to you this week is, is to look at the difference that Jesus has made in you. And it's going to be really helpful if you can ask some other people, what's the difference that you see in me? And then whatever it is, just praise him for doing work in you. Praise him for the gospel at work in you. But if that's hard for you right now, we as a church, we want to walk through you, walk with you through that. If life has grown stagnant or those zombies are kind of hard after you, that faith just feels like shifting sand, let us know so we can help point you to Jesus, just to help you look to Jesus. We, we're a body. We do these things together. We, we aren't to hide these things or be embarrassed by it. We don't boast. We don't have to say, boasting is, is, is telling people, a part of that is telling people or letting people think or wanting people to think we've got it all together when we don't. We just share these things with people. Or maybe you're, you're just truly hearing Jesus' call. That's the gospel. Maybe you're hearing that really for the first time. Maybe it's been said a bunch of times before, but right now it's, it's there and you're hearing it and it's time to respond and we are here for you too. So we have heard the gospel today. We have heard Jesus' call today to, to those who have never heard it and those who just need to rest in it continually. And the question for all of us is, will you respond And that's responding in praise as we sing in a moment. Or as we sing, and you may need to respond by just coming and talking to us. Pastors, we're going to be in the back there in the foyer. And you can just come and talk to us and pray with us about whatever it is the Lord may be calling you to. So I want to pray, and then we're going to respond. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much. You've given us faith. You've given us grace. You've given us Jesus.